Good afternoon, everybody, but I should also say good morning and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from around the world. I see approximately 75 odd people who have entered this session today. And this session is going to be focusing on a framework for reopening Ontario. Now, you may ask yourself that this is a cybersecurity, AI, data science-like conference. Why are we discussing a framework for reopening Ontario here? Well, the reasons for that is, is that tech jobs and jobs in cybersecurity and AI and our investments in AI and cybersecurity drive a very strong aspect of our economic growth. And we're here today to discuss this with members of our community who lead various levels of government in order to see what their thoughts are today and how we can support them with ensuring that we're back on our feet within no time. We're joined today by my good friend, Mayor Sean Collier from the town of Ajax. He's been instrumental in making this session happen. Mayor Collier, on behalf of the team at Durham College, on behalf of the Advisory Council, I thank you for leading this and making sure that this happens. This is your third session today and your tireless engagements with the community are greatly appreciated. We then have MPP Khalid Rashid, another good friend uh, of Durham College, but also of the cybersecurity community, has done a lot of work with Farooq Nair, who is the Chief Information Security Officer of Orion, the Ontario Research and Innovation Optical Network. MPP Khalid Rashid also spoke on cyberbullying at the last Women in Cybersecurity Forum. Thank you, MPP Rashid, for joining us. And lastly, Minister Rod Phillips, who is spearheading much of our financial push as we go through this difficult pandemic. Um, I did make a boo-boo with the scheduling, but he made the time to make sure that he was here for our community, and I thank him again for all of his efforts and all of the time that he's taking to support us. I'm going to jump right into the questions. Minister Phillips, I'll begin with you. We're knee-deep, or rather much more deep, into the state that we're in with this pandemic. From a financial perspective, can you take the first two minutes to give us your outlook and perspective on where we are at? Absolutely, and um, and Ali, let me uh, thank you for the opportunity. And the, I think this is a this is exactly. It's, I thought your your lead-in was good. So so uh, why is this a topic that matters uh, to to this audience? And I think it's because we are really at a at a fundamental um, uh, time in terms of what the future of our economy and what the future opportunities look like um, as a result of, uh, of what's happened with COVID-19. And so I think it's vital at a time like this that for this audience, uh, they get a sense of what we're thinking about in terms of, of how to open and frankly, just how, uh, how much opportunity there's going to be, I think, in this new environment. Uh, but your question around, around the finances, uh, let, me, let me start there. Uh, as a province, uh, we were on a path uh, towards balancing a budget. Uh, those who follow Ontario finances will know that Ontario is the largest sub-sovereign debtor in the world. So previous governments had acquired a fair bit of, of debt and we had made one of our objectives to, to get the, the books back in balance and then start to pay down that debt. We were on that path and it was about March uh, 15th, as I recall, uh, we had to make the decision to pivot quite quickly um, away from that path as a result of what was becoming quite evidently a global health crisis, but but now was clearly going to be part of a global uh, economic crisis as well. So um, we announced at the end of March, on the 25th of March, our COVID-19 response plan, um, $17 billion of direct and indirect support to support businesses and individuals. But essentially, getting to the question of the finances, really doing a 180 return and saying we need now this is why government exists is to be able to provide the supports whether it's in the health system um, or it's in the business and community system uh, that are necessary so so from a uh, state of the economy perspective um, since the 25th and we we really uh, were the only government in Canada that made a, a a direct shift and said, yeah, we're going to go from from uh, you know to a larger deficit. We're going to go to you know a, a different path because the situation requires it. Um, the situation um, has gotten worse in terms of the challenges that we faced economically. I can quite comfortably say now that you know this is the most difficult economic uh, circumstance certainly that I've seen in my lifetime, uh, and and that's because underpinning that are the challenges of the global health crisis. And we are uh, dealing with a great deal of uncertainty. And as this audience will know really well from a financial perspective, the one thing that markets dislike, the one thing that businesses typically dislike is that level of uncertainty. Typically economic issues come out of a root of economic uncertainty, but underneath that we have this layer 
of, of health uncertainty and in fact fear in many cases. So, um, so Ontario made a number of moves, as did, as did the government of Canada, as did our local leaders like Sean, um, who, uh, who essentially have managed to, uh, with the help of uh, the people of Ontario, flatten the curve in terms of the growth of the virus. And, and I think people made a lot of sacrifices to do that. And we are really right now, um, I mean, it's, it's a very challenging time uh, for many, many people, and I don't want to underscore that, but we're in a very interesting time to the extent that I think we are now just starting to be able to imagine, because we've come through the crisis piece, and we're now dealing with the reopening of the economy, and we'll talk about that if you're interested, but, but, the, but we're now starting to imagine and be forced to imagine how we're going to do things differently. What is this going to mean for some business models that, that, that we're reliant, for example, on large groups of people getting together when we may be in a situation where our public health officials will say we can't do that, at least in the ways that we used to. And I have to say, this doesn't just affect our economic situation. Um, I have had a couple of sessions with faith communities and, and everything. Our, our religious organizations are having to say, what does it mean when we can't, um, let's say, get together and sing, which is fundamental to some faith groups, or, or even you know, get together regularly and pray and worship? Um, and how do we adapt to that? Um, how do the normal events of life, think about the things that we all um, think about. We might think about the birth of a baby or a, a graduation or a, or a wedding or a funeral, sort of major events. Well, how are those events um, articulated um, but in the world where some of the things that we've taken for granted um, can't be taken for granted anymore uh, because they could be unsafe? And I think the other thing I'll say just generally is it's making us all uh, recognize our interdependence on each other. Um, yep. You know, each of us has to behave in the way that is best, not just for ourselves, but for the group. Uh, you know, I, I had a very um, um, profound conversation with one of my constituents, and I, I, I won't use her name, but she talked about being in the local Sobies in Ajax. Um, and, and she has a child who has a number of underlying health conditions who could be at risk. And she said, literally, Rod, when I go down the aisle and I see someone without a mask, I see a potential killer. Now, this is a kind, generous woman who would never think that way, but that's the fear that's inside, if not all of us, some of us, as we think about what is, you know, how do we have to try to think about the other person? So anyway, I think, I think there's a number of things that are going to be very profound in terms of changes, and it's certainly it'd be easy to lead into the technology components of that and what that's going to mean. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But, um, but listen, we are, we are at a, a fundamental... Um, uh, evolution point, I think, for our economy, for our society, as a result of this, um, whatever normal we go back to, at least until there's a vaccine, is going to be different, and perhaps even after that. And so I think that's why this session is so uh, so interesting and useful, because I think getting as all the smart people as we can, not just in Ontario, but uh, but through the great stuff that we do at Durham College in the region, and, and more broadly thinking about it, is, is fantastic. And I agree with you. And the whole purpose here is uh, knowledge is not about what's being stored. It's about what's being shared. Knowledge is about the interconnectedness that we have and sharing our resources. I want to take something. I mean, we're talking about the framework for reopening Ontario. And there were two areas that you really touched on was number one is the communications part to the, to the public, to the business owners, to the parents, et cetera. And number three and number two is the operational and the structure part of what do we need to do along with communicating in order to get us through this, which is a good little thread through which I want to bring in Mayor Sean Collier into this. Mayor Collier at the grassroots level, at the regional level, at the community level, there's obviously a lot of nervousness and a lot of stress. How are you working through this and convincing the community or helping the community understand that this framework that we have will get us through? We don't know when, but it will eventually. What are the steps that you're taking to communicate confidence and communicate some sense of certainty amidst the uncertainty? Well, I don't know if there is any, thank you, Ali. I don't know if there is any certainty amongst the uncertainty. I heard, a, I've used this analogy a few times. We're, we're building the plane as we fly it. I mean, nobody really knows where we're going with this. We're just, everybody is making it up as they go along and we're doing the best that we can. At the municipal level, we have to, for a certain amount, follow the leads of the federal and the province. So when the province declared a state of emergency and issued an order, um, that triggered us to do things like close our community centers and, and start taking steps that we needed to take to limit the gathering. I did things like closing parking lots and closing playgrounds, and we needed to do a lot of public messaging to get the word out. And you know, I've just been trying to stay positive. I've just been trying to give the message all the way through that 
you know, even though we're seeing some numbers that are looking positive, we're not there yet. And, and don't let up your guard at this point. Keep doing what we're doing. And so I just keep hammering that message home all every chance I get, every video that we do, everything that we try and promote is, is to get people to still continue to follow. Uh, unfortunately, as, as the, um, what was it, the Mother's Day weekend, um, I witnessed, you know, it looked like people figured, okay, we're done and time to move on now. And, um, you know, we're seeing numbers going back up a little bit now at the provincial level. So I hope that sends that message. Uh, I like things that Toronto is doing, you know, doing circles in the parks. I mean, that's, that's kind of interesting. It's a bit sad that we have to do that, um, that people aren't doing that themselves, but that's okay. That's part of the educational process. And, you know, we'll just keep doing that. From a town perspective, what we're trying to do to help, um, help the businesses as we come out of this is we're working towards putting things in place like um, uh, relaxing the bylaws and putting a streamlined process in place to allow, for instance, restaurants to use parking areas to expand their outside patios. Um, trying to get things in place to expedite that. We're looking at ways that how can we do, I really like what Toronto did with closing some of their roads and allowing the pedestrian friendly and the cycling and get people out but still practice social distancing. So we're looking at doing things like that. We're looking at ways to, to keep people engaged keep them educated and, um, and keep them, keep them distant. And I want to drive with that. That closing statement is something that I want to amplify a little bit more. Keep them distant. And when we look at the them, we're referring to professionals, we're referring to people, we're referring to students. Let's unpack that a little bit in the, in the context of this conference. MPP Rashid, you've uh, been engaging with, you know, the cybersecurity and AI community for a very long time. Besides myself, you know, folks like Farooq and Dr. Asim, et cetera, you've been working with them closely. You know, I'm hearing a lot from folks and I even got a question on WhatsApp where people are saying, look, we're keeping, you know, our, our best brains distant right now. Uh, is there a fear that we may even use, lose our competitive edge because our great, our great ideas come together when we collaborate and when we're able to engage with one another? Are we going to lose our competitive edge in the tech market, uh, in the financial market? Your thoughts, MPP Rashid? So first, I'm going to start by saying no. And then I'm going to say thank you, Ali, for uh, having uh, me. And also uh, thank you to Minister Rod Phillips and Mayor Sean for being part of this wonderful conversation. Uh, look, much has been said by Minister Rod Phillips from a financial side. Uh, but look, I don't think that we are going to lose anything from a technology side. Rather, I would say that this is the new trend moving forward. Uh, the, look, today we are having this whole cyber security conference over a Zoom platform. Uh, this platform has been there for years. While I was working for BlackBerry, we were using uh, Zoom as a platform, but it was something where people or individuals or companies were not comfortable. They were thinking that we should have face-to-face -face meetings but now this whole pandemic has changed the way organizations businesses uh, governments think uh, just this morning we had our first committee meeting over zoom which is almost unheard of uh, and also you can see that the government both federal uh, government has started using uh, technology uh, or certain platforms uh, for uh, virtual meetings, and now they are having hybrid uh, uh, parliament. So uh, I think this will uh, this is a, a change that everybody was looking for, but nobody had. To, it was just who's going to take the first step, and I think technology is is here to stay. And now we're going to see more and more changes coming, uh, whether it's from the cyber threat side, uh, cyber security, or even if you are not going to walk in, into a store, you're going to see certain uh, AIs that are going to be taking place uh, for, uh, because we have to still maintain social distancing. And, uh, but you cannot stop businesses from operating. Uh, I, I don't think uh, looking uh, speaking with some of the business community um, uh, around Ontario, uh, people have started to adopt that you know we can work from home, and we are uh, we are as productive as uh, if not more than we were sitting in the office because it's the commute time that yep. people are looking at now. 
I have had uh, uh, just last week, Minister Rod Phillips and I had a, a, a Zoom uh, virtual meeting and I was driving. I was driving while uh, we were having this conversation and I believe Minister was, was driving, but actually he was not on the driving seat, but he was on, <laughs> he was on the passenger side. But like, look, uh, it just saves a lot of time energy and and the efforts that actually we can put into more work uh, now so i think this is a, a good change uh, in terms of from a technology side and now you're going to see how people are going to transform their businesses and using technology as the key component and one last thing that i want to mention and minister phillips is actually part of the the committee as well too. Our government uh, from day one has been saying that we have to modernize our, our ministries. We have to modernize how we do business. Uh, one of the committees, uh, both Minister Phillips and I sit on is the Smart Track uh, Committee, where we're gonna see how we can procure um, government businesses by just using technology. Uh, so this is actually not only going to save our government uh, a lot of money, but actually taxpayers as well too, because at the end of the day, it's the taxpayer who's paying. And we have to find ways how to use technology to make sure that we run an efficient government, but also saving taxpayers uh, their, their tax dollars. So overall, I think, in my opinion, it's a, it's a great change that we are looking um, pro uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much. Ali, can I yeah. follow up on something that Khalid Absolutely. Rashid, Absolutely. The MPP Rashid was, and he's, he's been a great um, uh, help as, uh, to me personally as whenever I look at these kinds of issues of technology and advancement, but, but I think what he said is absolutely right. What we are gonna see, people say, well, what's the new normal gonna be? What it's gonna look like? There will be some things we don't expect, but I think the thing we can be sure is going to happen is going to be that amplification of the trends that were already happening. That magnificent these because the the and, I, and I'll say this as a fifty-something um, former uh, business owner, manager, CEO of some fairly large companies. There was a group of folks, largely in their fifties and older, who, quite frankly, um, were you know holding back you know, as the decision makers, some of the, the moves that could be made because of just the, the era of bums in seats and I can see my employees and, and this is the way the world works and inevitably leadership matters in that. The change I have seen in the last 12 weeks when I talk to the CEOs and the other people that my job lets me do in terms of the moves they're now making and the fact that they're taking credit for like, hey, I've just had this great idea. Everybody doesn't have to be in the office, right? You know, and, 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 and that is, that is, exactly what happens when those kinds of trends get amplified. I'll give one example without giving the company name, but it's a very large um, Canadian employer that had a plan to, to move a third of its contact center operators to offsite locations. They had a two year plan all laid out. They weren't sure two years might be long enough. They did it in two weeks. And, and I guarantee you that they're, that at least based on the performance metrics and other things that, that the CEO transmitted to me, he thinks it was brilliant. And, and, and that's and 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 I think so. I think so. I think um, Khalid is right on this. These 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 things. There may be there'll be some things we don't expect. There always are. But the things we can expect is that the the directions that we're just needing that push. This has been like a hurricane wind came behind them, and those trends that were moving are now going to be amplified. And the smart folks, including the ones on this, will start to think, what does that mean past that? Right? So what, whatever your challenge was, and I'll go a little bit back to my business background, but whatever your challenge was, because I used to uh, chair an AI company, and I remember it was always um, trying to get people to understand how and why this would work and trust, but it was really changing their system. But I think you're going to just see things push right past that. And you could be in a different set of challenges as we try to implement these. How do we move more quickly? How do we, like things that we thought were going to be a problem five years from now might be a problem next week in terms of the kinds of, because I think this adoption, uh, Zoom, you mentioned it was the excitement around Zoom and then suddenly it was, well, what about security on Zoom? Well, that was only an issue because, you know, 15 million more people were using it, right? And I, I wanna, I'll, go ahead, MPP, please. Just to piggyback on that, I, I absolutely agree with, with everything was said. What I have been very upfront with Minister Phillips as well as with, through Lumco as well, we've identified a lot of real efficiencies. I, I have done calls, uh, on the road. That's usually when I do my calls anyway, but this has kind of forced people 
that were hesitant before, they have to get with the, you know, start embracing technology now. And we have actually made the request to Lumco that the province, you know, they had to change the municipal act to allow us to use technology because the act said that we needed to have quorum physically in the seats. But well, we have actually asked that this be allowed to continue after the pandemic is over and after the gathering rules have been um, loosened up because it is so effective, not only for financially, and I'll use Lumco as an example, it's not easy to get 29 mayors all in one room and you've got to arrange hotels and convention space and food and travel and all these things. Well, we've never had um, attendance so high since we started using Zoom. And it's so convenient to get everybody together and you're saving all those, all that money, but from an environmental point of view as well, you know, you don't have all those people traveling. You don't have all that carbon. You don't have all those extras. So there's a lot of benefits that we didn't even realize uh, going into this. If you, if you're looking for some positives, that's definitely a positive. Uh, yeah, I'm Peter Sheets. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, actually what Mayor uh, Sean just mentioned that um, I, I know a few individuals, a few businesses who have said to me and to me, both Minister, uh, Minister Rod Phillips as well too, that, you know, previously if uh, they were traveling across uh, municipalities, it used to take them like an hour, two hours just of driving time. Now they can just have meetings at the comfort of their home. Mun municipalities are now having uh, meetings uh, over uh, video conference and all, and are achieving uh, the same goals, if not more. But here I would like to mention one more thing that uh, is very important is that uh, since uh, day one, our government has been uh, talking about, uh, you know, using technology for uh, our education system. Okay. And now if you see like, you know, how previously we said that we are going to start with uh, one or two courses, online courses. Well, guess what? Now uh, parents uh, are seeing that and credit goes to our educators as, as well too, who have taken the ownership of uh, making sure that our children who are at home are getting the same education as they are sitting in, in a classroom. So uh, the, it has become like a virtual classroom, but at the end of the day, children are still getting the same education. And this is exactly what, as a government, we have been saying from day one, that we have to slowly transform into a, a, a world which is full of technology. And we have to use and start uh, adopting technology because we don't want to be one of those countries or the province who are behind. And uh, there are other countries who are way ahead of us. So I, I think this is something we are going to see a positive change moving forward. And I'm getting comments now. So I'm, go I'm going to start weaving it all together. We have about 20 minutes and I want to respect your time. So I'm going to do my level best at moderating this and sort of synthesize what I'm getting here. So, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of this line where they say, you know, if uh, you have to be willing to be misunderstood if you're going to innovate. And there are a couple of folks who are just saying, what? You're seeing opportunity in this. You're seeing positivity in this. One of the negatives that have come up is somebody has just asked me and said, listen, um, I understand that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to innovate and do more things from a tech perspective. But if there's nobody there who's investing in our technologies right now, or there's limited investments or too much competition for limited investments, there are fewer buyers now in the market and everybody's holding back because they do not know and are kind of caught up in that uncertainty. How can you innovate without knowing and how can we do all of this without kind of knowing that? There is some sort of financial return. There is some sort of financial stability. There is both a psychological, but also an economical uh, worry that's hitting a lot of our innovators here, especially in the world of technology. Minister Phillips, I'd like you to, to start off to address that, that worry that I'm getting in my comments. Um, well, I'll be you know, blunt. People are right to be worried. It's a difficult economy. Um, we've seen uh, wealth uh, disappear uh, like that, right? In, the, in financial markets and in other situations, we've seen business models turned on their head. Um, and in terms of, uh, you could pick any number of, of, uh, of industries and say, so, so uh, there's absolutely a challenge and, uh, and um, it's not going to be government uh, who you know, can make it all better. 
um, although I commend, uh, I think the federal government, the local governments, uh, I think governments, including the provincial government, have done what they can do to, to, to manage an uncertain situation. Um, so uh, they, there is there is a absolutely and and you know if but if we're asking the questions, will there be opportunity in terms of innovation that was happening at a rapid pace? Yes. Will there be pools of capital willing to invest behind that innovation? Yes, there will. You know, are they easily accessible? My experience, I was in business for 30 years. They never were, right? I mean, if it, there was times when it was easier or not, but 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 money um, for new, fresh, innovative ideas is is often hard to come by. Um, yet, you know, uh, the, the economy continues to innovate. And how does it do that? Because, because innovation and opportunity, um, sometimes brought on by uh, a booming economy, sometimes brought on by pressures, uh, brings together uh, that, that kind of magic combination where, where you can see both the creation of new ideas and excitement ideas and the wealth associated with that. But, but listen, there's, there's, um, there's no question, and nobody I don't think on this panel is sugarcoating that we have some challenges. Um, but look at it this way, uh, you know, would you rather be running a travel agency right now? Um, or would you rather be um, people looking at, uh, you know, what's the opportunity from a cybersecurity perspective? Uh, you know, just to pick two, two industries. Uh, yeah. and, and maybe what we need is the people from the travel agency to connect with the people from the site. You know, maybe there's a solution uh, yeah. for, in that. But I think, um, but, but that doesn't mean there aren't gonna be challenges. That doesn't mean we aren't in, gonna be in difficult times. Um, but it does mean there's a lot of opportunity uh, for all the reasons that I think Sean and, and Khalid have said. Yeah. You know, they say, right, when the winds of change blow, some people build walls, some build windmills. So we've got to figure out what we want to build here. And, 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 you know, let's be fair to everybody. This is um, still an evolving situation, fundamentally from a health point of view. And I think that the way um, I articulate it sometimes, I mean, people, when they think of their families and themselves, there's two fears people have being sick and being poor, being unable to have their health and being unable to you know, provide for their families, right? This crisis we're facing for the first time in generations brings both of those risks together. Now we're learning, clearly not the same for everyone, right? There are different levels, but, but at a fundamental level, and particularly when you think about the unprecedented saturation. I don't, in, I don't recall ever there being so much focus from a media perspective, social or traditional, on this day in, day out reminders of this. Um, you know, we have a press conference. Uh, Khalid, my boss, have a press conference at one o'clock every day, every day, right? You know, to and, and you know, one day there was as many people watching that as watched the closing episode of Friends, which for, for your younger viewers they won't appreciate what that is. But there was it was a big show that that uh, that, that Sean and I watched. Um, but uh, but that but that's but so you've got a, a level of of um, of understandable anxiety yep. that I think we just have to acknowledge and say okay what am I going to do about that um, and what am I going to do to see opportunity in that to help my community in that to all those all those things. Thank you for that and let's let's build a little bit on these opportunities and I want to give MPP Khalid Rashid and Mayor Collier uh, a little bit of time just to expand some more on how you've got businesses and entrepreneurs, et cetera, to see the opportunity. There's a bit of a, and I'm getting this from the questions where there's hope, but there's a bit of a, you've got to communicate it in a certain way and you've got to lend support and you've got to bring resources to the table. So Mir Kohli, let's start with you. If you can take two minutes to talk to us about how have you helped your entrepreneurs and businesses you know, realize there is opportunity because you've got the innovation village that's flying, that's coming up and you're working away at it. But things have changed. How are you keeping that conversation going? Well, from the, I'll talk about the municipal level first. My, our, our planning department is still very much hard at work. Uh, it's business as usual, although, although remotely. And so all applications that we have are still being processed. So once things are lifted, we can hit the ground running. Uh, we also have a number of grant applications in the works for federal provincial funding. And when that becomes available at some point, again, we're there ready to go. From the regional level, um, when we talk about technology and we talk about broadband is an area that really needs really needs help and i don't know what the solution is for that whether it's 5g whether whatever it is but one of the things i brought forward at the region is we have a substantial amount of reserve funds and we all know the interest rates are you know at historic lows again so we're making nothing on that money what i've been telling them at the region and i do sit on the finance bar and the finance committee is that money is better invested in the ground right now pre-servicing our employment lands putting in the, you know, 
addressing the sewer capacity issues that we have in, in Ajax that's limiting our, our, our development. But putting, putting fiber in the roads, like every time we dig up a road, we should be proactively putting fiber in that pipe in the road. And maybe we can't hook it up and, and light it up all at once, but over time we will put in enough infrastructure that when you are able to connect, we're ready to go. So those are some things we can do proactively. As far as business, we've been holding a lot of uh, online type meetings to help to help support business. And I think businesses have been, been very proactive themselves. I mean, we've got a local resident that's created a Facebook group that's now got over 9,000 members in Ajax that list every restaurant that has takeout service, right? Um, we've got other groups that are doing different things. People have figured out different ways to do things, whether it's the guy that changes people's winter tires over in their driveway or the people that cut the grass or the people that, um, you know, we had a, a barber, a guy with a barber shop thinking, okay, when we open, what's the best way to do that? So I've got my staff right now working on proposals where uh, an economic um, opening type policy where we're going to hopefully be able to provide a checklist and some guidance to the residents and to the businesses on the proper ways to do things. I recognize the fact that, you know, smaller businesses, the sole proprietors might not have access to or be able to buy in bulk from the big distributors PPE. Yeah. So we're looking at a way is, is there a way as a municipality that we can stockpile some of that and help provide that? I actually sent a letter, uh, Rod, to your office yesterday asking for um, some relief if possible. Uh, there's the bonusing provision that we don't want to violate by, uh, by supporting business. So is there a way we can get around that and still help our businesses open up? So there, there's a number of things we're doing, but uh, for the most part, as far as the um, making the decisions, we very much at the municipal level have to follow the rules of the province. Um, Rod, I, I think you, you used my line the other day where just because you can doesn't mean you should. Or maybe that was yours that I borrowed. But either way, we're, we're both using that line these days. And uh, I've been saying that at the town level, that I recognize businesses need to open, but we need to make sure it's done right. And we need, need to make sure it's done safely. So we're going to do everything we can to, to assist with that within the means that we have. Thank you, Mayor Collier. MPP Rashid, I want to give you uh, two minutes to talk to us about how you, in your community in the Saga area, how are you getting this message across about, hey, there is an opportunity here, here are resources, et cetera. What are some effective strategies that you are seeing? Uh, Ali, basically, look, I have never installed so many apps on my phone uh, that <laughs> I've done in the last few <laughs> weeks. Right. Because, uh, look, I look at this way. And we have been saying this for years and years that, you know, this is the future of this world is all about applications and from ordering food to uh, going uh, and uh, uh, ordering groceries, everything is now on the palm of your hand sort of thing Like you, you click on an application, you can order food, you can order groceries, you can order services. So the, the world is changing. And what I have seen in the last few weeks is that companies are also now starting to think outside the box. They are looking at, you know what, okay, maybe I need to start uh, creating uh, or developing a, an application for my business. Correct. Because that's where people are looking at now. So what, what I see is that in, in the near future, we are going to see uh, more businesses shifting towards uh, like application, but this will also bring great opportunities for individuals who have this technological mind to start developing applications, to start developing, looking into technology as a, as a career, because now this has opened a floodgate of uh, job opportunities where people are now going to enter into technological world and start uh, developing uh, applications or you know working on cybersecurity side yep. so uh, what what i i see and, and have and have been having conversations with a lot of businesses is that they are actually very excited and a lot of people in the last few weeks that i have had uh, the opportunity to have conversations are now saying you know what uh, i think we need to change the way we have been doing business uh, just just a small example. One of uh, one of the, a huge box retailer is, is, has now changed their uh, the way they do business. 
now it's everything is online um, yeah. you can order groceries and just go and pick up groceries so you see like uh, all these opportunities are going to lead us toward uh, job new job opportunities and i and i think that this is where uh, i see that uh, we uh, as a government playing a huge role of uh, you know, encouraging uh, young you. entrepreneurs to to get into this business uh, alongside many other business business opportunities that this uh, post COVID nineteen is going to bring. So let's let's jump then into this into a little more de- in a little more depth. We're see, we're talking about opportunity. We're talking about yes, we're acknowledging their challenges. We're not sugarcoating anything, and I fully respect and appreciate that. All the I've got about eight questions. I want to summarize this. Our framework for opening Ontario, as you've mentioned, has stages, and it's talking about doing things responsibly, doing things slowly if we need to, but doing them right, and opening when we're fully ready, because there's a health concern just as much as there is a financial concern. The question that's coming to me from all of these questions, if I summarize it, is that, yes, sure, correct and responsibly, but we've dived right into the digital ecosystem, even deeper now, very quickly, as you mentioned, companies were planning five years of provisioning into uh, working remotely, and now they did it in two weeks or something to that effect. We've gone into this extremely fast. Number of cyber attacks are increasing. The professionals that we have in cybersecurity are growing distant from one another, although using Zoom, et cetera, and other tools to stay connected. But we've gone into this, and the attacks landscape has increased dramatically. Farooq Nair, for example, when I met, when I worked with him at Orion, started off a strategy to bring all the universities and colleges together to manage their cybersecurity needs. Is it time that from a provincial standpoint, we need to do something where we have some sort of a task force that looks at our framework for reopening, but also looks at how are we going to use these digital tools in a way that we're protecting our economy and our citizens? Mr. Rod Phillips, I'm going to start off with you. Yeah, Ali, I think that is a... Um, a good question. I'll tell you what we have done along those lines is um, I've struck, uh, the Premier asked me to chair a jobs and recovery committee, which is the government's sort of principal effort around looking for the economic relaunch and recovery. And so uh, my ministerial colleagues and myself, and also through our uh, our caucus colleagues, and frankly, the opposition caucus colleagues, because it really is all of our challenge, have, have been reaching out and looking into uh, what are the things that we need to be understanding as we look to a recovery. And I'll give you an example. It's not exactly the one you talked about, but I'll give you a related technology example. Uh, we had been doing a fair bit of work around data. And uh, we, you know, we just recently saw the Sidewalk Labs decision to walk away. Uh, but it was an interesting uh, conversation for those not as familiar with it. I'm sure this, this audience is. But you had that, that argument or conversation between, I guess, to be frank, kind of monetization and privacy and the, the, the two twin polarities. And, and it kind of just spilled out into a, into a, into a conversation. Um, and it was interesting and useful and educational to see where society was at in that regard. Um, we have a, you know, a huge amount of the value of our future economy and even our current economy is being driven by data. Um, and one of the things that has been talked about actively inside our government, and we talk about public, is the idea of data trusts, right? How do we capture and manage that data in a way that makes it available for the broadest base of people to take advantage of and not the proprietary uh, owner, you know, ownership of, of a certain select few? So, so there's an example of something, and then cyber, cyber security, and, and that could be a similar one, where that has gained some momentum in terms of the conversations we've been having. And interestingly, across a a whole series of of sectors where it's about data in the mining sector, it's about data in the agriculture sector. It isn't a data strategy driven by an IT strategy. It's, It's people in those sectors going, wait a minute, why does John Deere have all the information about planting and, and that, you know, and, and why does that make sense? And, and there's models, for instance, the model to the South is it's a fairly proprietary model from a, from a point of view. And there's other models, European models and other models around data that say, hmm, maybe the, maybe the, the public good might be best served by having more open access yeah, right. to that along some, some, some sectors. So I think now is an absolutely great time for those conversations. Um, you know, Government won't be the host of all of them. We have a particular uh, platform to, to, to have them from, but God knows we're not going to come up with all the good ideas. Um, and, uh, and so we open, and I, in this case, uh, because of the relationship with uh, MPP uh, Rashid, I would absolutely encourage through that venue, uh, Khalidza has been very involved in the development of these conversations. 
feed that information in because, you know, for example, because of those sectoral strategies, just taking data, um, there may be the opportunity to create data trusts along a dozen industrial segments yeah. and, and to say, that's what we're going to do. And you know what, because nobody disagrees. It's just, nobody could get around to doing it. And, and now, you know, why not take that transformative opportunity, right? Similarly, there could be opportunities here. So I'd invite you, uh, obviously to me is fine, but, but Khalid is frankly more knowledgeable and, uh, and I always go with the smart guy, give him the choice. Um, so, uh, but I would say find that niches, feed it in and, um, and let's get going because you know, all the uncertainty that everybody's, uh, chatting about and, and talking about is there, but, but this is the way we this is the way we come out of it. Appreciate that. MBB Khalid, we'll go with you. 30 seconds. Your thoughts on this idea. And I'm getting a lot of suggestions, including one that said the Cyber Exchange Advisory has folks like Dr. Ann Kabuki and Farouk himself, Michael Ball, uh, Kat Kood, a whole bunch of other folks who are esteemed professionals in cybersecurity. What are your thoughts on creating some sort of a group that can look at securing our, our online transformations? Uh, well, Ali, uh, look, you always learn from the best. And I think I'm learning a lot from Minister Rod Phillips uh, through this, uh, this process. So, and he has been a great mentor uh, all along this, uh, this process. Uh, I, I look at this way. Five, six years ago, when uh, you used to say IoT, Internet of Things, uh, people used to say, what? what are you talking about? What is IoT? And now IoT has past uh, and things have changed and there is some new technologies that are coming out. Uh, look, as Minister Phillips said, uh, we, we definitely welcome any suggestions and uh, um, I will definitely be bringing those suggestions to Minister Rod Phillips as he chaired the, that committee. Uh, but also let's start thinking outside the box and, and see how when you talk about cyber threats, uh, look, cyber threats, they will always be there. Uh, I'm sure some people are paid heavily to to go after uh, these these threats. But again, with a anything or everything, there is an opportunity. And how to, it's, it all comes down to how you handle that opportunity. Okay. So, so I, I think that uh, there we are here to work with uh, with everyone. We are here to continue to listen. And uh, I, as I always say, and, and as Minister always say, we are all in this thing together. Uh, and we all are going to come out of this thing stronger than ever before. Eric Collier, the closing comments will be with you. As a, as a mayor who's over the last year taken Ajax and brought it into the digital landscape and into the tech landscape so strongly, uh, how important do you think a task force of this nature or some sort of educational Im impact or initiative around cybersecurity to ensure our framework for reopening is sound and resilient? How important do you think that is and should we be doing it? I think it's incredibly important, Ali. And one thing I've learned in the last probably year and a half since I met you and we started our relationship with Durham College yeah. and the AI Hub and CyberX is um, how how little we actually know and how vulnerable we actually are. One of the first things we did in Ajax last year was initiate a full IT strategy, and that was hiring consultant to do a deep dive into our IT. Because we've all heard of the, you know, the ransomware attacks, even in places as close as um, Burlington, for instance. I mean, it, it, it's happening and we're just not prepared for it. So we've done that. We're putting the system in place. Uh, I think having a provincial task force that would head this up would be a great idea. Because even though we are, we are getting very heavily into it and looking very deeply into it in our municipality, I know there, there may be others that are not. And, and if the province wants to drive this, this bus, that would be great because they obviously have a lot more resources than, than the town of Ajax or, or a lot of other municipalities. So it's, it's a great idea. We're on board. We're doing what, what we feel we need to do right now. But I'm certainly open to, um, as what, what uh, MPP Rashid said, I mean, you always learn from the best, right? So I, I, I'm always willing to, to listen to other people because I know that I know very little. Mayor Collier, not only have you spearheaded some important initiatives, you also have uh, North America's first cybersecurity escape room and VR room in Ajax called ICEVR. Um, so thank you for all of your support, Minister Phillips. Without your uh, support and without your consistent guidance, we wouldn't have been able to do stuff like Global Cyber Olympics in, in the Durham region and in, in bring in talent to our communities and to grow our relationships. And MPP Khalid Rashid, I mean, since CISO Forum and, and onwards and Women in Cyber, not only have you been attending these events, you've been making it very clear that cybersecurity is not just about 
knowing, for example, how to initiate a pen, uh, a pen test, for example, there's elements of social engineering. There, there are elements of psychology that you need to be thinking about. And in this framework for opening Ontario, we need folks who are not just technical folks, but people who understand when we go into a di highly digitized economy, there are other factors that kick in as well. So MPB Khalid, thank you for your time. The one thing I will say is the message that I'm hearing from this session is that uh, the famous line by Wayne Gretzky, right? I skate where the puck is going, not where it has been, all right? And that's what we're doing here. This is gonna take time. We're not sure about certain things. Yep, the, the artist and philosopher in me likes to say that uncertainty is beautiful, but I can't quite translate that into this environment. But I do know that uh, we are making sure that we are checking our blind spots and the framework for reopening is very clear to us that we wanna make it a framework that works. And if people have ideas, so on and so forth, you've now heard from some senior folks that they're willing to receive some sort of an idea on how we can create a more robust and digital environment from a cybersecurity perspective. I have a lot of folks from the Cyber Exchange Advisory Committee. Some, for some reason, they asked me to lead the committee for this conference. Um, and I can guarantee you that in the next couple of weeks, you will be receiving some sort of a paper from us on what we can do to ensure that all of our businesses are up online, safe and secure, and how this can translate into other initiatives. With that, it is 3 p.m. I know you folks have a lot of things to do. Everybody, there are about 80 people here. Thank you so much for joining in today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. On behalf of the Cyber Exchange Advisory, thank you all. On behalf of uh, Durham College and my students and Don Lavisa and Debbie McKee, uh, I thank you all for giving us the time. Uh, I have to head out into another session, so I will see you all later. If you have any more questions, just tweet at me. And Thanks. Thanks. Bye now. Bye now.